You're watching Face to Face. I'm your host, Tim Vince, and I'm delighted to be joined again by Dr. Peter Walker. Peter, it's a blessing to have you again. And we, we are um, talking about um, your uh, video series and book, In the Steps of uh, Jesus. And I don't know how we're going to manage it in 27 minutes, but we're going to be talking about um, Jerusalem yeah. and, the Mount, and the Mount of Olives. So yeah. could you, the first thing I'd say is it's an excellent a video series and um, you know how did you manage it? <laughs> well with great difficulty it took many, many years we did four major shoots uh, in um, 2016 and 17 in which we did uh, three of these videos on, on each occasion um, it, often in burnt, burning heat and it was really quite difficult on occasions sometimes just one um, uh, American um, camera camera person uh, at work and some great editors uh, also in America helping me um, it was great fun. We sometimes had to stand, for example, we were still on the Mount of Olives for 45 minutes and standing in exactly the same spot whilst various tourist buses course, went by. Busy. And busy. then we're waiting before the Muslim call to prayer comes and you can't film at that moment. Yeah. So you, you've just got to stay there and just hope you get your two minutes that you need. Mm. And we had some other sort of fairly hilarious uh, times when uh, someone was starting to cut down trees and it was five months past five. Five minutes past five, the sun was about to set and we just had to get this clip yeah. in the next two minutes. So shouting across in Hebrew, please stop felling your tree because we just need it for two minutes to have peace and quiet. So that's the behind. Someone hands you a, 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 a whatever, a map saying, oh, you know, would you like to buy a map or ads? You just don't want that. And I often used to get slightly frustrated with some things which were going on behind the camera yeah. that I could see and yeah. you just have to be calm and peaceful and just keep smiling at the camera and keep thinking. Um, about Jesus. So focus, yeah. focused on, on the script. Yeah. Um, uh, should we do a quick uh, recap? How did, how did the Lord get to Jerusalem? What's the backstory? Well, he's been in Galilee. Uh, he has been to Jerusalem before. Um, we know that from John's Gospel and elsewhere. But in the Synoptic Gospels, we have a very special emphasis on this final journey up to Jerusalem. Actually, it really begins way back in the, in the north of the country, even north of Galilee in Caesarea Philippi where uh, he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, and if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to follow suit. Yeah. And as we know, Simon Peter thinks it's a disastrous idea. Uh, he begins to rebuke Jesus, actually. You can imagine him rebuking Jesus, yeah. and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have the things of, of God in your mind. Uh, and uh, please follow. And that was after he had said, flesh and blood hasn't, <laughs> hasn't revealed this to you, that I'm the, the I know. So Pe the Peter's had God. a great moment of revelation, yeah. which comes from nowhere, as it were, or yeah. comes from the Lord, and then suddenly he blows it straight away. Yeah. So that's Peter for you. Mm. But Caesarea Philippi, a very powerful mm. place in the north of the country, actually a pagan centre, uh, where Jesus is now being confirmed as the true Lord of the world, as opposed to the emperor in Rome, who's being worshipped in that Caesarea Philippi town. And then we have this incredible story going up the uh, Mount Hermon, or the, the foothills of Mount Hermon perhaps, uh, where we have the story of the Transfiguration. Yeah. And that is a story which says Luke is where he's discussing the exodus that he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Amazing. And from now on, we know that Jesus is going on a journey to Jerusalem, which is going to affect, bring about something as dramatic, as powerful as the great exodus story uh, out of Egypt into the Promised Land, Jesus is going to do something victorious, strong, liberating, and is going to take his people into a new Promised Land. That's really exciting. So, so without, I, I'll try not to interrupt too much. We'll never get through um, the the. Um, but the walk, which walkway are you going to take? As uh, uh, I know, in in your in your video, you talk about what I would say Beth. Beth Page Beth Buggy, and yeah. Bethany. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. just talk us through it and I'll try not to interrupt too much. Well, OK, we come down from um, Caesarea Philippi, past Galilee. We come down through um, Jericho, uh, Luke 19. Then we have the story going up from Jericho, probably setting off early in the morning because they want to get up to Jerusalem, 2,700 feet above sea level before nightfall. It's late March. Uh, you know, the sun's going to be setting in the late afternoon. Um, so it's an early morning start. They come up towards the Mount of Olives, and then uh, he, uh, Jesus tells a couple of disciples to sort of slightly back detour towards Bethany uh, and Bethphagi, two villages which are nearby to each other. And there they requisition the donkey, and they bring Jesus there. Uh, well, they bring the donkey to Jesus, and he gets on it. And at that moment, you can sense all the tension and hope of the Galilean pilgrims coming up behind Jesus and they're about to go over the crest of the Mount of Olives and when suddenly, says Luke's Gospel, 
when they came to the crest of the Mount of Olives, where the, the road begins to go down, they all burst into praise for all the wonderful things that they had seen. It's an electric moment in the Gospels. You can't read Luke 19 without sort of sensing this pulsating love for Jerusalem, this Galilean pilgrimage, this festivity, this Jesus on a donkey, why mm. on earth is he on a donkey? Mm. And then you begin to think, well, Jesus knew what he was doing even if no one else did. Mm. And he's picking up a prophecy that Jerusalem's king, Zion's king, yeah. was God himself. Yeah. Zion's king would come to you humble and lowly on a donkey, and, yes. and it's a, an electric moment. And the Pharisees are watching, and they say, tell your, tell your disciples to, to, to keep quiet. And he says, if I told them to, to keep quiet, then even the very stones would cry. Right. Yeah. And it's as so though the stones know that their creator is passing by. Amazing. So you have That's a wonderful thought. It's incredible. Uh, but also, uh, as w when we were talking about the Galilee, it's in the context of a, of a culture that's sort of expectant of a Messiah, and they've had yeah. others who claim to be well, the Messiah. Well, th they have, and in, within the generations around before uh, and after Jesus, you do have other Messianic claimants coming up within the Jewish culture. There's a man called Simon ben Giora who uh, goes on the Mount of Olives and is there standing on a ho uh, sitting on a horse telling the Romans, uh, we've got power to invade you, we're going to march in, uh, on, bring, bring in the cavalry, if you like. Uh, and so Jesus is, is um, fitting exactly into these kind of expectations, but always subverting them and being the real thing and doing things in surprising ways which fulfill the, the, the role far more spectacularly than, than they were imagining. And there's a really strong political climate, uh, as we noticed in Galilee and so here in Jerusalem, these Galilean pilgrims, they do come up on pilgrimage for religious reasons, but they've probably got a, a, a storm the capital mentality as well. That's right. And they're wondering Cutting if, off of the ear. Cutting of off the, the ear, ear that's well. right. Uh, they, it says in Luke's Gospel, they thought the kingdom of God was going to come when Jesus got to Jerusalem. So what's that going to look like? They don't know, but they hope it's going to mean the Romans are out and they're going to be in control. And uh, the nation of Israel will have an opportunity to be Lord in its own land because it hasn't had it for a yeah. hundred years. So you've got to feel those religious tensions and political tensions. And you've got to feel for the disciples as well that they didn't get it, because I don't know whether we would have got it, as it were. Oh, we can, we um, can. And that adds to the authenticity. Oh, you absolutely. Know, the fact that they really only it dawned on them afterwards. Uh, the penny didn't drop. I think on Palm Sunday, no one knows what's going upon, apart from Jesus himself. By the time the gospel writers reflect on it 30 years yeah. later, the penny has dropped. Yeah. But at the time, the disciples are pretty well clueless. And we often judge them but actually we would have been even more clueless, you know. And they'd never seen someone raised from the dead. Mm. <laughs> we now know what Christians claim at the end of the story. They're going through it in a lifetime. They go for through it forwards. Yeah. They don't have any exactly. uh, advantage of hindsight. Um, it's 101 blind alleys I could drive you down, but we're, we're there on the, the Mount of, of Olives. Uh, okay, yeah. And, and uh, you know, more than once, the, yeah. Lord, the Lord, that was a very special place for him. Yeah. Yeah, and I think he see, we read in, in Luke's Gospel, it's the place which he frequented. He spent a lot of his time there. So you've got to think of him almost commuting into Jerusalem every day, going back and sleeping in Bethany, uh, being out there under the olives, doing some of his teaching. And there's a sense in which the Mount of Olives is a place where Jesus is uh, establishing his, his alternative kind of center of operations. And then he looks down, notice the word down, onto the temple, and all of that Jerusalem down there, and he, he says, you know, judgment is coming, not one stone will be left upon another. And the day of the Son of Man will be the most important time. Watch out for that. That's more important than what's going on in Jerusalem. And he's beginning to set up himself as a kind of alternative centre, yeah. a counter capital, if you like, yeah. uh, over against Jerusalem. And I think the Gospel writers have picked that up and realised that mm. um, Jesus is saying, you know, Jerusalem, really important but actually one more than important than Jerusalem. He said one more important than the, the temple is here. Um, and I think that's what we're sensing in the Gospels, a little bit of the contrast between Jesus and Jerusalem. Jerusalem is amazing, <laughs> but G uh, and is, the br is the bride, if you like, but Jesus is the bridegroom. Yes. Uh, and it's, uh, that kind of power is there in the Gospels, and that tension as well. I'm not going to jump the gun because we have one more clip if folks watch the other programme um, that we will play in. But let's talk more uh, a little uh, on, on the passion and, yeah. and locations, if you yeah. dare. Yeah. Well, obviously, Jerusalem's archaeology is endlessly being investigated for the last 2,000 years to see in, in what ways it matches the Gospel account. I had a privilege to spend four years of my life studying the way in which the 4th century Christians tried to work out what was where. 
uh, from the gospel narratives. And from that, I got a good sense of, I think, when they were actually onto something genuine and also when they were Marking up the wrong tree. Yeah, I was going to say running blind. That's, but yeah, and you get a lot of that. Mm. But if there's an early tradition going back before the time of Constantine, that's in the th early 300s AD, if there's an early tradition before that, um, it's pretty likely to be authentic mm. because it's a pretty tough thing to be a Christian in Jerusalem in the first three centuries AD. Minority, often persecuted. But if they guarded a place, it's pretty likely they were holding on to what their grandparents had told them. That is the place. But equally, with Constantine and his mother Helena, yeah. that you, um, she would have picked up on some of those. You know, obviously built in yeah. on a grander scale. Yeah. But there could be a continuity. Yeah. Yes, I, I genuinely yeah. believe that the three churches which she is involved in, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Mount of Olives Church and Bethlehem, there's very early tradition there. So it's not as though she, she suddenly comes yeah. in blind. She's yeah. actually coming on the back of local um, fostered tradition. Yeah. But the one place I want to sort of focus on mm. uh, actually is what we now think of as the scene of the Last Supper. Yeah. Uh, and it's on a hill which is confusingly known as Mount Zion, uh, which is an upper hill in the upper city of Jesus' day. And there's a very strong evidence that the early Christians in the second century AD, about 170 AD, um, were worshipping determinedly and doggedly in a particular place uh, on Mount Zion, even though everything around had been ruined and devastated by the Roman destructions, and it was now actually outside the tiny little city of Jerusalem that had been left mm. by Hadrian. Mm. Why were these Christians worshipping in this strange location surrounded by cucumbers and melon fields, it says? Yeah, and potentially exposed as well. And potentially exposed and in a ruinous old building. Well, almost certainly because they had a strong sense that this is where something, at least one or two gospel events had taken place, and they were determined to worship in the place. And so the place of the upper room. It's the place we we the upper often room. go there. Yeah. Um, and y yes, it's a, it, it, there's a sense, it's a special place. It is a special place. It's known as the Seneca, which is a Latin word for the, the, the Last Supper. Mm. Um, and when you go there now, it is an upper room, but it's, it's clearly rebuilt by the Crusaders, and it doesn't, in that sense, look authentic. Yeah. It's convenient because it's the size of a coach for <laughs> people. It is actually, and, yeah. and, uh, and it's not used for religious services either, so you can go in. Yeah. And, you know. But putting that to one side, it's just fascinating. If you take this as authentic, uh, then it could well be that this is the place, yes, for the Last Supper, because it may be that this was um, a place where the Virgin Mary and other the female disciples of Jesus had a chance to sleep during the week that we know as Holy Week. Mm -hmm the male young disciples, well, they were allowed to go off to Bethany and sleep in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. But, no, where did the Virgin Mary sleep? Well, maybe there was a room. Was that the place where Jesus was able to come with his male disciples for the Last Supper? Uh, was it the place where the disciples came for fear of the Jews on, on the first Easter day? The doors were locked. Uh, it could say be, upper room. Uh, it says upper room. Mm. The day of Pentecost is associated also with an upper room. Mm. Uh, where, were, where were they gathered? Because they weren't the most popular people in town. They, were they gathered in one safe place? And then we have in Acts chapter 12 the story of Peter escaping from prison and going to the place where he knew the believers were praying for him on an all-night prayer meeting. And he knocks on the door and a servant girl called Rhoda comes to the door. And where are we? We're in the house of John yeah. Mark's father. That's right. But I she forgets to let him in. She she gets to, I know, and he's left standing there gawping. <laughs> She's so surprised. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, which, is, which is another yeah, So it's real John touch. Mark's father's house. That's, yeah. And I reckon if you yeah. can then work that backwards, it's quite likely it's exactly the same house. And John Mark's father, mm. the father of the John Mark who travels with Paul on his travels, but later writes what we know as Mark's Gospel. Mm. And therefore, I actually believe that John Mark's father said, yes, Jesus, you can come with your disciples, and what's better for your Last Supper, I'll also make available for you a nice sleeping place. You don't have to go back to Bethany. You can sleep in my Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. which is a nice enclosed area, and I'll give my son, John Mark, the keys to let you in when you arrive there at 10 o'clock at night. And that would explain why in Mark's Gospel there's a young man who runs away naked up the Mount of Olives, mm. because he was there on guard letting Jesus in with the disciples, and then when they, they come to arrest him at 2 o'clock in the morning, he, he tries to put up a struggle, and then um, someone whips his, his nightshirt off him, yeah. and he has to run scart naked up, up the Mount yeah. of Olives. And it's only described in Mark's Gospel. Yeah. So I, I reckon all this begins to make sense of the, the Gospel narrative in such a creative way, and it also explains where some of the women who went visit the tomb on, on the first Easter day, where were they sleeping? 
Yeah. And where were they going out from? And where did they rush back to to tell Peter and John? It's all probably this one place. Amazing. So and it makes know, sense of the, the Easter morning narratives. Yeah, yeah it's, it's wonderful. We, we, we always start in that. We, we see the house of Caiaphas around there with yeah. St. Peter in Galicanto. Yeah. Yeah. I won't take you down that alley. But we do, yeah. you know, you can do it in, in a day. You yeah. walk and, yeah. and follow the, the yeah. footsteps. Yeah, and you can go from there down to Gethsemane and yeah. back and follow. It's, that, that's a yeah. powerful part of the... Dare I ask about the... You know the fortress of Antonio, Antonio and, yeah. and um, yeah. Ecce Homo. You know, is that well? Is that if you read where my, the arch is, <laughs> well, yes. the arch. Uh, people may, may not be aware what we're alluding to yeah. here. But there's the, uh, uh, the, the questions from the Gospels as to where the trial of Jesus took place, mm. and also the questions about where the crucifixion took place. Yeah. Uh, um, for a full account, I've done this book, Correct. The Weekend That Changed the World, yeah. where I give all the arguments in favour and against uh, of all these different yeah. pl places. But I would say concerning the trial of Jesus, I think it's very unlikely that it actually is, I'm afraid to say, Ecce Homo. Yeah. I believe uh, on the Antonia Fortress. Yeah. I believe it, it was actually um, the palace of the Herod the Great by the Jaffa Gate. Uh, the David Citadel. And the critical Other question end. there is where would Pontius Pilate's wife have wanted to stay? In yes. a Roman barracks in the Antonia Fortress with 200 soldiers in a male only place with no comforts. Or further or up the hill. Further up the hill, just yeah. by the entrance to the city, yeah. you can sneak in there without being found out in luxury in a former palace laid out with some, a few swimming pools. Yeah, wonderful. So yeah, I think I should, uh, you said it very quickly, but The Weekend That Changed the World is an excellent book. and, the, and um, which I read, I don't know when you first, when it was first published. 1999, I think, yeah. Yeah, so not long after that. And, and then uh, Walkway Books yeah. um, has a, a list of yeah. your other bibliography. Well, that's yeah. right, yeah. Go to walkwaybooks.com if you'd like to. Uh, In the Steps of Jesus is yeah. there, uh, The Weekend That Changed the World. In the yeah. Steps of St. Paul and uh, the Story of the Holy Land as well. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I don't know where we are on, on the gospel journey, but let's let's take it from there where do you want to, where do you want to go to next because you, uh, you we, we're going to show a, a clip from, uh, from the Mount of Olives yeah. um, do, you, do you want to just talk about leading yeah. up to that and sure sure well um, uh, we go back to the Mount of Olives at the, at the end now I think because uh, from there you get a perspective of over Jerusalem as a whole and it was where Jesus as it were um, um, spoke and predicted what was going to happen to Jerusalem and it's also the, the, the mountain where he ascends eventually to the Father. So it's a kind of the natural place to bring things to a wrap and then to look back on the story. And uh, so the, the clip we're about to see is something which is just reflecting on Jesus weeping over Jerusalem in Luke 19 and then some of his words in Luke 13 uh, in which he is saying how much he loves Jerusalem but how much tragedy he senses is in store for her. Thank you. So it worked very well at the, on our last face-to-face -face with Peter. So um, watch this very short clip that Peter's just described. Jesus evidently loved Jerusalem and her people. Back in Luke 13, he'd said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. Those are words of deep love, like the tender love of a mother, but also of deep concern. Jerusalem seemingly has a strange reputation for rejecting God's messengers. So Jesus senses that Jerusalem will ultimately not receive him, but will reject him, the ultimate messenger sent to her by God. And the result will be catastrophic. Sorry, they're so short, these clips, but they, they, they can be, the, the whole programs can, can be viewed. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, and I think uh, the Mount of Olives there just gives us an opportunity to take stock and to stand back and to think what was really going on. And I think we just have to say that there was an enormous event took place when Jesus came into Jerusalem. I think Palm Sunday remains perhaps the most powerful yeah. Sunday of the year, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Obviously, Easter Day yes. is, is not to be yeah. minimised, but the, the sheer power of Jesus coming in with all the authority and all the predictions and all the prophecies behind him. And when you especially also remember that uh, in the Old Testament, there's a prediction or rather a picture of the Spirit of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, departing from the temple, mm -hmm. going over the hill to the east of it and into the desert. This is in, in Ezekiel. Yeah. 
and uh, the glory of the Lord has departed from the temple. And now someone walks up from Jericho over the Mount of Olives and goes into the temple and kicks up a storm when he gets there. And I put it to you that that's probably the glory of the Lord returning to the temple. And Jesus is just doing this, but actually, could it really be that he was the presence of God on earth coming over the Mount of Olives into the place which had been the place of God's presence, but now it's been embodied in a person called Jesus. This is powerful stuff. And, and you, you draw a, a comparison to um, when he looks at the fig tree and, yeah. and it's out of season, out of season. and he, he finds no fruit. Yeah, and, uh, and he has authority to pronounce judgment on a temple institution which is not bearing fruit as the, the owner of the vineyard, if you like, would have loved to see fruit but came to his harvest field and found there was nothing. And so it's the Lord himself coming to his own temple mm. and towards his own people as well and saying, this is not right, yeah. but I'm now, I've now come <coughs> and I'm going to establish something new myself. Yeah. Excuse me. I can't, <coughs> uh, yes, um, I can't resist um, making a comparison because I, I think that, I think it's Ezekiel 11 <coughs> where it talks about the, um, uh, 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 the glory yeah, that's going right. to Ezekiel the mountain 11. of the east. Mm. Uh, but then in Ezekiel 16, it talks about the unfaithfulness of Jerusalem. So mm. it's there in mm. the prophecies. And I can't resist asking about, you know, about how there is a parallel with the church. Mm. You know, it does, <clears throat> it, it, yeah. there's, there's something in the Lord's sorrow over Jerusalem that, that could be applied to well, the church. <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, and that's ab absolutely right. Um, and whenever we find Old Testament passages which are speaking strongly and prophetically against the people of Israel, mm. we must always open ourselves up to this being applied to anyone who now claims mm. to be within the people of God today. Yeah. And so you, that's an exactly right move. To, in order for us to hear the, the very powerful and I'm afraid negative voice of Ezekiel, um, uh, against the people of God in that day, we must never think, oh, well, that applied to them and doesn't apply to us. We must always make sure that the cap fits on us as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so what would the Lord say if he came to those people who claim to be his people today? Would he find us biblically faithful? Mm. Would, he, would he have to say, I, I love you desperately, mm. but you're like uh, a wife who's deserted, like Hosea's mm -hmm. uh, wife, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, um, and the unfaithfulness of the bride is a very strong theme within the Old Testament, and it's, uh, it's, and it's a warning to us in the days of the New Covenant as well, the unfaithfulness of Jesus' bride. And, and the, uh, the other thing about the temple with the money changers was it created an obstacle mm. for, you know, in the court of the Gentiles. Exactly. And yeah. we spoke in the Galilee about the you know, Galilee of the Gentiles. The Lord, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's tragic if, if, if religiosity yeah. you know, and crookery is creating a barrier. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, um, you know, Jesus warned the Pharisees in Matthew 23, you know, you go many miles in order to, to try and bring people in, but you yourself don't go in and you keep others out. And so, you know, religious people, and this is true of all of us in, in potentially, you know, can a end up creating a circle which makes us look, feel good because we're you know, at the center of this nice little circle and there are other people outside and that makes us feel good. But the gospel turns that inside out. Yeah. And Jesus has a heart even more for those on yeah. the outside, not to leave them where they are, no, yeah. but to bring them in yeah. uh, and uh, so they can fi find him. And so he's always got that kind of critique of the way the church as his community has put a hedge around itself. Now I want to throw in one, it's, uh, it's a big risk, but you know, at the end of uh, Matthew 23, the Lord says, you'll not see me again until mm. you say, you know, welcome mm. in the name of the Lord Barakabha. Um, and then he also says, uh, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all peoples um, mm. in Matthew, wherever it is, 28. And then the end will come. Mm. Um, are we expecting a physical return of the Lord Jesus to Jerusalem? We're definitely expecting a manifestation of the person of Jesus Christ who embodies the, the glory of Jesus. Everything mm. there is clear from the New Testament. Mm. One in 20 passages of the New Testament has this hope and a hope that is certain in the return of the Lord. And it's there in some of the earliest texts. Um, Paul and Thessalonians, you know, um, they already are wondering about when the Lord is going to come. Yes. That wouldn't have happened if the apostles weren't teaching this as an organic part of the message. 
As to the physicality of where it happens, or is it as the lightning is from the east and the west and the yeah. whole world knows about it instantaneously, uh, I think we can leave that yeah. as, as an open question. But let's yeah. be clear about the, the New Testament hope for the parousia, which means the presence of Jesus. That's right. And so let's, in, in our final minutes, just talk about what it means to people personally. You know, this wonderful um, historic um, accounts, yeah. you know, in this beautiful land. What, yeah. what, what's the relevance to someone in the 21st century? Well, in a sense, the story of Jesus ultimately is, is the story of the world. And we only find our true place in the whole map of human history if, if we if connect with him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we get baptized, we're brought into his story. We die with him. We're raised with him. And we find ourselves, we find meaning, we find identity, uh, because he, he is the one for whom we were made. Um, so go to the Holy Land if you can. If you can't, well, perhaps watch my videos, because you can travel in your mind's eye and in your spirit. And if you, re if you digest what we're putting across there about the historical Jesus, I really believe that the risen Jesus will be able to teach you about himself and draw you to himself. Right, another risk. It, it, can we now quickly rattle through all of the programmes that you have and where, where, you, where you start? You've literally got a minute, so go for it. Bethlehem part one and two, Nazareth, desert, Galilee part one and two, Caesar of Philippi, hope I haven't forgotten anything, uh, Jericho, Mount of Olives, Bethany, Jerusalem part one and two, um, and Emmaus. Emmaus. Yeah. And, and so that is another wonderful account of yeah. the Lord revealing himself to yeah. his disciples. Yeah. The risen Lord meeting us on the way. And that's the whole point. Jesus walks along, us, along with us on the way. And what, 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 what Walkway Books is about yes. is helping people to walk on the way of Jesus, to walk the Jesus way in the steps of Jesus. Yeah. Not just on a physical journey, but on a spiritual journey, which is even more important. Yeah. So I probably said go too fast on that but uh, yeah the, the road to a mess so that's something to really look forward to yeah at the end of the series yeah yeah know, luke 24 is the absolute goal of luke's gospel and it, for me it's probably the most precious passage mm -hmm. um, of scripture that there is and i've written another book on that called the jesus way which is all 12 insights on how to follow jesus the jesus way by looking at what he said in luke 24. so wonderful walkwaybooks.com com that's that's wonderful. Well, I've really enjoyed walking through thank you. Been <laughs> some, some of these wonderful insights, yeah. Peter. Thank you great so to much. Great to walk with you too. Yeah, bless you. I'm trying to think of when I can invite you back to talk about something else. But um, thank you very much for joining us, um, uh, Dr. Peter Walker, and um, make sure to look out for In the Steps of Jesus, Jerusalem. Thank you for joining us on Face to Face. <laughs>